I've heard, thank you. I heard a couple of things this morning, uh, and I heard a lot yesterday that made me want to just not bother with the presentation I was going to give. And some of you may have seen me talk before, but have heard the things I've, I'm, I was going to say uh, on previous occasions. Firstly, I was fascinated by Professor Gao's comments about the mutations in the candida species and how there was increasing hair loss, uh, I noticed, in the mutations, which did make me think of what mutation state to Brian and myself are at different stages of hair loss, and can that be reversed? That would be very interesting, and I think that would be a major commercial success. But uh, uh, probably not in my lifetime, as we were hearing yesterday, for the diagnostic tests. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that. I do have some questions, and I'll just leave the questions there. So perhaps uh, you don't mind voting on these questions. Having heard uh, three tour de force uh, science uh, basic research uh, talks this morning, let's get back to the real world just for a second, just for a second. So in your clinical practice, uh, you know, what, what would you say out of these various things uh, is the major limitation? in your clinical practice? For those of you to whom it applies, obviously. A, a range of things that the assays, uh, uh, vote when you're ready, uh, please vote, well, when the music comes on. Availability of current biomarkers, about a quarter of you. Um, uh, uh, well, that's very interesting. Uh, it's split between one, three, and five, which, which I think is actually very sensible. So I'm in complete agreement with all of you, well, the majority. Should be ne ne and there's one more question to follow this. So well, the corollary of that is which one, it might be fairly obvious now how you're going to vote, would make the biggest difference, do you think? Would it be access to timely uh, current biomarkers? Uh, let's not worry about two. Uh, actually getting bronchoscopy done in a timely fashion, if that's what you want to do. Or would it be having the information of drug usage, diagnostics, in a way that allows you to say what's going on in your unit, in your hospital? So would you just like to vote on that? Well, uh, I don't know quite what's happened between question one and question two. Uh, I didn't expect this, uh, and you'll see why half of you voted in the room, nearly two-thirds. Uh, I hope I'm about to show you something which uh, will answer uh, your request. Uh, so if we could s switch to uh, this monitor. So what I'm showing you is uh, part of the title there. Here we go. So we're online here. This is the fungal, uh, uh, the fungal audit tool, which I've been working on for a number of years. And this has now been modified uh, to deal with the issue of stewardship. As stewardship has become such a, a major issue in, in, well, for antimicrobials in general. And, and in the antifungal field, it's, it's fair to say that it's, it's really in a fledgling state in most institutions. And it's, it's a lot more complex, I think, than the management of antibiotics. So I got this two days ago, uh, and it's in the phase of UAT, for those of you who know what that means. I believe it means user application testing. And it's my job to feed back to the people who've made this uh, database of all the things that are wrong in it. And I had a look at it over the last day when I had a bit of time. There are a lot of corrections to be made. But all I want to show you, if it will work, is what you, you can get out of this. So this is a web-based system. Uh, it uh, will allow you to collect the data that most of you would think is relevant to your patients. I'm just quickly skimming through it. This is just a navigation program for a patient I put in yesterday. Is patient 234567. So it doesn't really matter. But you can see uh, along here the different bits of information uh, in the system, and I'll just give you a flavour of what's in there. So let's go to this uh, window. Uh, whoops, wrong one. There we go, it should be there. So, I mean, it, I'm struggling manoeuvring this, but I just want to show you. So here, the system uh, is asking data on the uh, antifungal prophylaxis which is fine, I mean, if you want to put the drug in, if you want to put the dose in, route of administration, that's up to you. But what I just want to emphasize as you come over here, there's also a comment about stewardship. So if you were interested in 
seeing how your practice was going, you know, what was your comment as your antifungal stewardship team? You would collect it in the database, and this applies to uh, all the information in there. And that's all I'm going to say about it. So that's it. Thank you. This has been designed to uh, collect the information relevant to antifungal management. But in fact, you, you can't uh, clinically try and make any sensible uh, conclusions about antifungal management if you don't know what's happening with the patient's other antibiotics and the other diagnostic features. So the system will collect that information if you want to collect it. So I'm not going to talk about all of these things. I'm just going to pass on that. And you've heard about all these things uh, yesterday. Oh, dear. I thought I'd change these slides. I didn't think I was in there. But so this is what we're trying to get away from. This is the clinical situation we're facing, as we heard yesterday, not just in hematooncology, which is what I do, but also in the intensive care setting, and probably in most clinical settings dealing with invasive fungal disease. And that's what we have. We don't have a pathogen. So I was fascinated yesterday when the question was asked, which is the most useful test in the first talk yesterday for invasive aspergillosis, 40% said a CT scan of the chest. I didn't. I actually said a lateral flow device, but I could easily have said galactomannan or PCR. Because at least those tests have some suggestion of what the pathogen is. And as we've heard yesterday, uh, see to any imaging does not tell you what the pathogen is, not with, the acid, not with the tools that we have at the moment. So this is what we're trying to get away from. Are we going to treat every patient that we think may have invasive fungal disease as if they have invasive fungal disease? Because that's when we get in a terrible mess and we never know what the organism is and your CT scan does not tell you what the organism is. Okay, so I'm going to pass on all of this. Don't want that. So, where we've got to now at... Uh, this is our clinical uh, programme uh, at BARTS that we're going to introduce. And just before we introduced it, this was our antifungal spend in the last 12 years in hemato-oncology at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And you can see we spent variably up to £1.2 million pounds in our hemonc unit. Now, we have uh, Dr. Cisse here from King's. He'll be looking at that and thinking, well, you don't spend very much. But uh, I think some of you will be thinking something else. We changed our algorithm. And in the last year, we spent 700000 And I would contend that very significant decrease was the implementation of a galactomannan and CT-driven strategy. Nothing very clever at all. But that's what we've achieved. And during that time, we've actually increased our activity in the high-risk population uh, enormously. So it's probably a real decrease, probably. In terms of clinical outcomes, I'm guessing, because we don't get very po many post-mortems. But we think that's true. And we're not happy with that. So this is a slide I passed on earlier. And what we're going to do, as, as we heard yesterday, we do have diagnostic tests. And I mentioned if I'd answered that question uh, of Professor Barnes yesterday, I would have suggested either galactomannan or PCR or lateral flow device as being the most useful tests for detecting aspergillus that we currently have. So we're going to introduce all of them in our clinical practice. And you can say, why? Well, we heard yesterday Everyone believes we have more confidence in what we're doing if we use more assays in the right way. And we're going to use them at the first point, which is in blood. So this is a diagnostic-driven strategy. We order a CT scan, and we will do those assays in the blood at that point in time. And lower down, if we get a bronchoscopy, we will do those tests on the BAL fluid. Now, I'm not presenting the data, but we've gone for this approach based on our own data using BAL fluid where we find these assays are extremely uh, useful, even in patients who've had seven days of mold-active treatment. And I think that's a, something that was mentioned yesterday, are the assays any good after treatment? Well, I think they can be if you use the right tissue sample. So I'm not going to talk about that. And just say antifungal stewardship, I think, is definitely coming. These are the assays we're going to use in this uh, testing service which is provided by Public Health England out of the laboratories at, Saint, at the Barts Health NHS Trust. 
We heard a little bit about pathognostics and their kits yesterday. We were thinking of moving to them clinically as they're already CE marked, they come in nice packages, save a lot of headache, and that's not going to happen because of the cost. So unless they reduce their cost enormously, we will stick to what we've developed locally and get that CE marked uh, in-house. Uh, and this is what I want to talk about. And the fungal audit tool uh, and how, if we started to use this as a community, you would use it for your own unit or your own centre, but we would all be collecting the same data. And that would allow us to pull data anonymously and start to have data sets that are more meaningful than what we currently have. I had changed all these slides. You can ignore all this. Uh, Peter Donnelly will be familiar with this slide because it's uh, filched from the Gilead database for their prophylaxis study of uh, ambazone versus placebo for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But what it shows you is the information that the database would generate pictorially. So you, you will get this in this system. And that halo shows you all the information of biomarkers, CT scan, temperature, neutropenia, uh, plotted out for you pictorially. Not very helpful in real time, but fantastic if you're trying to review your cases for audit purposes. So what do we hope we will get out of our new policy? We'll control drug costs, as we have done, maybe decrease them. Are we going to be doing our patients a disservice? And I thought we heard so much information yesterday telling us that studies have been done to say you can use biomarkers and diagnosis and not treat immediately and be safe. So, uh, uh, and maybe we'll get better outcomes if we're using these uh, drugs properly. And this is what I think we should be trying to do. I mean, I've, I'm so encouraged by this meeting and the number of people that have been here who are probably not all members of BSMM, who are probably not all members of UK Clinical Mycology Network or ISHAM, they clearly have an interest in the area. So perhaps as a group, I oh, haven't changed the slides, never mind. We could be working together to develop a clinical research network built on the groups that already exist, BSMM, UK Clinical Mycology Network. And I would make a bid that uh, if we could get together as a group afterwards, we should have a national repository tissue bank for all pathogenic samples dealing with fungi. In hemato-oncology, we now have national tissue banks for acute myeloid leukemia, lymphoblastic leukemia, CLL, myelodysplastic syndrome. I cannot see why we shouldn't have a similar uh, utility in a fungal area. And with that, why would, this has been tried and failed, but why would people do it? People have to buy into it because they believe they will get something out of it. We'll have shared authorship, shared access, uh, we'll share clinical protocols, and we will uh, bid for clinical studies and attract them in uh, to the UK. That's what I would hope. And I will leave you on that sentiment. Before uh, I finish, I have to have to say one or two thank yous, and it, perhaps we could all put our hands together for the AV team at the back, who have been... <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. So Andrew, Craig, Jamie, and I think there's Adam as well, and there's someone I've missed out, and my apologies. Uh, you've been fantastic. This is our 10th year, and it's, the, the AV has been wonderful, as has uh, the Oscar-style uh, podium. So thank you for that. Please remember, do not go home with your keypads. Please leave them on the chairs. This meeting could not have happened without the sponsors. I'm sure you've seen some of the sponsors and interacted with them. And I'm very, very grateful for their support. And in the organization of this meeting, there are th three, two people and one organization I have to mention. There's Janet Allen of Gilead, who's been absolutely sterling in all her efforts for this to happen. Ruby, some of you have met Ruby, my secretary. And those speakers amongst you would have interacted with Ruby on more than one occasion. Uh, and Gemini International, who came in very late in this uh, process, and Chris and Alice have been fantastic. And I have to thank you all. You've just about survived. And it's been a fantastic meeting for me, and I hope for you. Thank you.